Former Chicago vocalist Jeff Coffey releases a great version of I Can't Make You Love Me featuring super producer Michael Omardian. We'll talk to them next on Rock History Music. Remember to subscribe to our channel and make sure you click the bell notification so you don't miss any of our interviews. We have plenty coming up and there's always music news every single day, right? Jeff Coffey is one of my favorite interviews. He always takes the high road. He works incredibly hard at everything he does. And no matter where he goes, he's always in demand. As soon as he left Chicago, he joined Don Felder's band as a vocalist and a bass player. Which takes us to another in-demand fellow you might have heard of, Michael Omardian. One of the great super producers of the last 30, 40 years. I loved his work with Christopher Cross. And we'll have a separate video about how that happened, which is really interesting. And a big video series on Michael Omardian coming up where we'll talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. And remember, before we get to the interview, there's a link right at the very top of the description of this video where you can hear his version of I Can't Make You Love Me. Michael Omardian and Jeff Coffey in studio. John, Michael Omardian. How are you, John? You All I have to say is this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Michael, no, 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 no. I got to do it. Uh, I got to be able to tell my friends I did it. I find it interesting that you two guys are in the same room considering, Jeff, where you've been, obviously, Michael, where you've been, where Solitude Solitaire, it was that guy who produced Peter Cetera's most successful album. It seems like you're you're so in that pocket. And also, another thing about both you guys. Jeff, when I first met you, I noticed that, I thought, here's a guy with a curious brain. He's a curious guy. You know, he's, he's interested. What happens if I press this? And Michael, I mean, you're still doing this. You still got that curious mind. I'm just saying this is an excellent pairing with you two. It's, uh, I, I just have to say, it's complete honor to not only even be in the same room with this man, but to make music with him is like, it's beyond a treat. I mean, we, we did a session Monday, uh, in town here, and, uh, we had, uh, we, we actually recreated, um, for this record that I'm doing, uh, a great Kenny Loggins track, This Is It. And I had my man Tristan Bowden come and play the track that he recorded back 40 years ago. And Michael played piano on it, brilliant piano. I, it's so, when I listen to the track back, it's just like, wow. I had Chris Rodriguez on guitar. It was an incredible day in the studio, and, uh, and I, I'm still reeling from it. It was, it was fun. Well, you know, uh, the, the first time I really heard Jeff live was I was up at Sweetwater in the South Bend. This is, what, two years ago? Was yeah, it been that long? Yeah, two years ago. And he was the lead singer at the time, the Sotera parts and all that kind of stuff. And I just sat there and went, holy cow, man, this cat is just bring it, you know. So, yeah, I know with, with Peter, I mean, you know, obviously he's probably around my age now. So I'm sure that the, the keys are dropping a little bit. Whereas with Jeff, man, you're up there in the, you know, he's up in the moon, man. <laughs> but it was incredible. And so when I, uh, John Pichotta, who's uh, been producing with Jeff, when he called me about being part of this latest Venture, I was more than happy to, to be part of it. So it's it's fun. I don't ever lose the love of playing. There's other parts of recording that I don't love as much as I used to, but playing is always a, a thrill for me, especially with a talent like this and doing some great songs. I got to ask you, Jeff, you know, I keep, I'm projecting here. If I was in the room with Michael, I'd be going, do you remember the, like Chris Farley with Paul McCarty? Do you remember the time, <laughs> you know? That was awesome. Yeah, I still have. Okay, yeah. Uh, I know. I mean, you know, uh, we we've sat and he's he's shared some great stories in the studio, and that's that kind of stuff I love. I'm like, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall back in those days, and and we talk about how much fun it was in those days to record and make music that way. When you've got a bunch of people in the room playing together, you know, there's there's a synergy that happens, and. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's a great. It we've we've had a great musical communication when we were recording together. So I mean, it's it's really very natural, truly, truly very natural. natural. Very yes. You know, the, the other thing too, people don't talk about, and I talk about this, and other musicians have brought this up because I didn't think of it because I'm not in rooms where you guys are. Is helps when you get along with someone. It helps when you have a a mutual respect. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because I don't. Nobody does as many sessions as there used to be. I mean, it's just the 70s, the 80s, before all the computerized music started coming into being, 
you would literally go from morning, afternoon, and evening. You probably have three different artists that you're working on in three hour increments. And so when you say fun, there was a different kind of fun. You didn't really understand how much fun you had until usually in retrospect because you're so busy doing something. Whereas now I find because of the infrequency of actually being in a room with other musicians, you really do have fun. And, and you, you appreciate and you enjoy what you just did, whereas you were already moving on to the next thing. So fun was, hey, it was cool hanging with you, but I'm going to hang with you tomorrow and the next day or I'll see you tomorrow night or whatever. Whereas you, you now have an appreciation that you probably didn't have at the time. Did you have time to breathe, Michael, in the in the 80s and 90s? You were going full full throttle, and I'm going, do people know the successful at the time of being successful, or are you too busy working? Uh, I would say, uh, again, you got caught up. There was competition, friendly competition, but there was competition. So there were, you were always – I had this conversation with someone yesterday. We were just talking about this, and that is, is that – you spend so much of your time, I wouldn't say worried, but, but somehow concerned that you weren't at a certain place that only now do you go back and go, I should have gotten more out of that as far as satisfaction and happiness. But everybody was kind of running fast, trying to say, and I, and I remember a couple of times, but I was in a room with a couple of artists, they go, and the, when one guy left, he said, I'll see you on the charts. And I'm going, that's exactly kind of, <laughs> that was the idea. And there were, you know, the, the thing that I was able to benefit from was when, when guys like Foster and Graydon and all these guys were starting to become producers, we were the first wave of musician producers. Prior to that, it was ba basically liaison between a record company and uh, the uh, artists. And uh, they would hire arrangers. They would hire whatever they could. But back in those days, we were kind of treading new territory. So there was a little bit of animosity about us kind of coming in and taking a little bit of the territory over from other people. So, you know, there was always a little bit of a, a competition. But like I say, and I'll always say it, that at, at my age, I wish I would have really enjoyed what was going on more at the time because it was really, you know, you're just trying to work your way up. The latter. You weren't screwing people or, or treating people badly, but you spent a whole lot of time worried about where you were at the moment. And it wasn't time well spent, as far as I'm concerned. You know, you're in a room with a guy because you both want to work together. Right. Yeah, which was which was uh, really thrilling for me that, uh, you know, we reached out to Michael because, like, like you said, we had met a couple of years ago, briefly, you know, at a Chicago show. And um, I when I... Uh, I've told you this story before, too. Uh, where When I first met him, I'm thinking two things. Wow, the records that he's done yeah. that have been a part of my life. Yeah. And the second thing I was thinking, God, I would love to get into the studio with him. Yeah. You know? Well, now it's happening, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. We reached out to Michael, and he said, absolutely. So I was thrilled. And, mm -hmm. and it's been a really fun experience so far. I, I, you know, uh, it, I look forward to more. This guy can sing. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, we did a Queen tune and, and the other day, and it was high over and over again. And every time we ran it down, he was right there man, singing the high notes. And he was like, so we don't know what that tune is, right? Not a lot, not, not yet. Well, we're we're going to keep that we'll as a keep, surprise. We'll keep that record. as a surprise. <laughs> it's, not a, it's, it's, it's kind of a left field one of theirs, yeah. a little more operatic. Okay. It's not pop as much as operatic and so i mean i was just sitting there going dude i don't i don't know how you're doing this <laughs> plus he had to to anticipate six vocals in the next couple days to finish all this so i mean it was a lot of work and I, he doesn't even his throat isn't even sore i mean maybe it's sore i but, hide it well <laughs> but it doesn't sound like it's been shattered at all i mean it's just amazing and when i went and saw him at the chicago thing i went you know what this is probably one night in many back to back to back and He's singing all those high parts, and the keys are the original keys. It was about five shows a week. Yeah, five shows a week. And I don't know where I was without, well, as far as a break or whatever, but I'm telling you, it was as clear as could be. And it was like, wow. Certain people are blessed with a strong facility, and he's got one. Wow. Faculty. You know, so yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. 
pretty cool. Well, and you know, I thank you so much for nah, saying I'm that. You know, I'm serious, man. But you know, we we've had this discussions too, where we'd be in the studio together, and there there's a there's a, a, a couple of songs on this record where we just did piano vocal. Magical moments for me um, uh, because there's so much expression going on. But you know, the thing about Michael's piano playing is brilliant because the voicings that he chooses on the piano, you know, people don't play like that anymore. You know, it's just really, really beautiful voicings, and it's great to sing over. You know, Thank you. and uh, you know, I I can't wait to share this stuff with everyone. It's good. There you go, part one of our conversation with Michael Omardian and Jeff Coffey. I think we've got about five parts in this series. Michael, what an interesting cat, huh? After all the work he's done, unassuming, just a guy. And what can you say about Jeff Coffey? Very, very classy people. I love my job. Coming up in a few days, we'll have part two of our conversation with Michael Omardian and Jeff Coffey. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Mm -hmm.